Welcome to the business interview. I'm Marcus Carlson. The Eurozone could get stuck in a stagnation trap without decisive action. So says the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. The OECD also says the euro area poses a risk to the entire global economy. To talk uh, more about that warning, we can turn now to the organization's chief economist, Catherine Mann, is with us from the OECD headquarters, uh, which is uh, across town from our studios uh, here in uh, Paris. Uh, Catherine, very, thank you very much indeed, first of all, for uh, speaking to us. Pleasure to be with you. Now, Catherine, when you warn of a stagnation trap, what, what exactly does that mean? Could you explain that to us? So the stagnation trap in Europe, what we're really worried about is the downside risk of having zero inflation and zero growth. Uh, obviously, the zero growth is something that everybody can appreciate because associated with that, you know, we'd have unemployment stay at the very high levels that we have it now, maybe even rise further. Now, the zero inflation, you know, some people might say, well, gee, that's great. Prices aren't rising. But zero inflation can lead to consumers deciding, well, I'm going to delay my purchase, so maybe the prices will be lower tomorrow. And so that causes consumption to contract even more, and it creates a downward spiral. So the, the sort of the zero zero for inflation and growth is something we really want to avoid anywhere, but we particularly want to avoid it in Europe. So no inflation, low, low, uh, low employment no levels or, or, or high unemployment. W yep. What needs to be done to escape this stagnation trap then, uh, according to the OECD? There is decisive action needed on monetary policy, on fiscal policy, and on structural policy. Now, of course, the monetary policy is for the euro area as a whole. Uh, the ECB has in its uh, arsenal a variety of new uh, mechanisms in order to ensure that credit is extended to the uh, private sector, to businesses, and to, uh, in some cases, uh, that's out on the edge, into governments. Now, fiscal policy, uh, different countries are at different places with regard to their uh, need for fiscal policy adjustment. Uh, some countries in the periphery, for example, have done quite a bit of fiscal adjustment already. Spain, Ireland, Portugal, Greece, and they should, they should be cutting less. Uh, France, also cutting less. Germany should ha does and should have the room for expansion. On the third leg of the stool, and we've talked a lot about this, there are three legs to the policy stool, and each one of those legs is, uh, is essential. They are complementary. The third leg is structural policy. Again, each country has different things that it needs to do in order to allow the monetary policy and the fiscal policy to actually have traction to improve the economic well-being of citizens in the country. Uh if we look at w what kind of action has been taken mm. so far, the European yeah. Central Bank has, has out already outlined a whole range of measures to yep. boost the Eurozone economy. And, and this right. week, the European Commission unveiled a 315 mm -hmm. yep. billion euro investment program. Yep. It, it seems that steps are being taken in the right direction. But will those steps, those current steps, be enough in your opinion? If, in fact, the ECB is successful in extending credit and expanding its balance sheet, getting credit into the hands of the private sector so that it can engage in economic growth, if, in fact, the investment program that was presented yesterday at the European Commission translates into good investments, and if, in fact, the countries that have already you know, put out their reform programs, France in particular has a range of reforms that it has put on the table. Implementation in each one of these dimensions on monetary policy, on fiscal policy, on structural policy, implementation is key. It's one thing to talk about it, it's another thing to do it. Are you skeptical that the, that implementation will actually happen? I'm actually not as skeptical now as I was maybe uh, six months ago. I think that uh, the projections that the OECD has put forward, but also projections by other uh, macroeconomic forecasters, uh, have really raised the sense of urgency um, among the policy members and policy community here in Europe. I think there is a sense of urgency. I think there is a sense that as policymakers, we really need to be talking with one voice about the need to move Europe forward rather than sort of arguing about, you know, one person, one country does this, one country does that. 
The reason why it's important for everyone to be uh, on the same page, for policymakers to realize that their uh, objectives to move forward are complementary for their country, but also for the region as a whole, the reason why that matters so much is that business con confidence and consumer confidence depend on having clear messages from their policy leaders uh, that they policymakers understand what's actually going on, that there is a sense of urgency. Uh, that confidence factor is extremely important mm -hmm. in getting the, you know, getting the ball rolling. Speaking of clear messages, yeah. we, we have seen very different visions in Euro mm -hmm. European yes. capitals over how to resolve the crisis, essentially. Germany is adamant on austerity, whereas mm -hmm. Paris and Rome are, are favoring more spending, even at the price of higher debts. Yeah. Are you then, uh, as an organization, stepping in on, on the French and Italian side and, and against the German argument of, of budget uh, rigor? That's too strong a statement. Um, I think it casts it in too uh, oppositional uh, phrasing. Germany, too, understands that it cannot be uh, growing successfully and translating its growth into benefits for its citizens if the rest of Europe around it is not doing well. And it's also the case that other countries within the Euro area, the Ireland, the, uh, Spain, Portugal, Greece, uh, Italy, that these countries also need to have, they've, uh, they've undertaken a lot of reforms, and they need to have economic activity in order to ratify the reforms that they've undertaken. Those have been tough reforms, and they need to have growth in order to make it worthwhile, both economically for the citizens and politically for their uh, policymakers. So collectively, the euro area as a whole understands that it needs to move forward. There may be differences of language about exactly how to approach that, but even in Germany, there is an understanding that a pure mix of austerity and, and nothing else, that doesn't lead to an expansion, not in Germany and not in the rest of the Euro area. That's why they've put forward some approaches, especially with regard to investment. So there is, I think, an increasingly a common understanding among policymakers that you have to have both, uh, you know, monetary, piss, uh, monetary policy, you have to have fiscal policy, and you have to have structural policies all working together in order to get the Euro area collected collectively and individually moving in a better direction. One final note on monetary policy. Uh, we've mm -hmm. also seen German reservations against uh, so-called quantitative easing, right. which essentially means that the ECB would step into the markets and buy government bonds, mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. that, well, Berlin hasn't been too keen on uh, right. so far. Do you think that the ECB should do QE? So there was a number of different things that the ECB can do before they get uh, into the, the quantitative easing uh, by purchasing sovereign debt directly. And it's also the case that there are a range of alternatives to direct purchases of individual sovereign bonds issues that are out there in the marketplace. There are a variety of ways that uh, sovereign bonds could be packaged up. And so uh, there would not be quite so much of a, a clarity about whose debt was being purchased. And I think that that might help some of the reservations. But I think the, uh, the point is that the ECB has to move forward concretely with uh, doing more balance sheet expansion, ensuring that credit actually is taken up by the financial system so that it can be on lent to the private sector. That's an important thing that it needs to do. It has some challenges to get that done, uh, the way the financial system is structured, but it has ways of doing it. And I see more, as I say, this sense of urgency that uh, it's time to, to really uh, put the pedal to the metal, so to speak, and get uh, Europe going faster again. Mm -hmm. I, I want to turn briefly to another widely discussed topic mm -hmm. this week. Uh, oil prices. Uh, mm. Oil prices have slipped well below $80 yeah. a barrel, uh, and we've seen, seen prices at those kind of levels for the past couple yeah. of weeks now. Mm. What does that mean for the global economy? For most economies in the world, uh, lower oil prices is good news uh, because it allows consumers to take what they would have spent at the gas station <clears throat> or in heating oil or 
other sources of energy. Uh, it allows them to take those, uh, those uh, euros or yen or dollars, whatever, and put them out into the marketplace to buy goods and services. So for most countries around the world, lower oil prices are very good news. Of course, there are for some that that's l less so. But uh, on balance, lower oil prices are going to be associated with a, a underpinning of more robust growth, more uh, robust consumption around the world. So it's good news. It's generally good news. All right. Uh, we're going to have to wrap it up there. Catherine mm -hmm. Mann, the chief economist at the OECD, I want to thank you very much indeed for uh, being with mm -hmm. us. And uh, I also want to say thanks to you guys at home for watching. Do stay with us. We've got more news coming your way.